and we'll then, uh, as I said, when we get to questions, press star six to get in the queue to have questions and comments. The recording has started. My name is Dennis Speed, and I would like to welcome everybody to today's Fireside Chat with Lyndon LaRouche for December 26, 19. This is the day after Christmas. And so in, uh, in, in the spirit of the season, I'll start with the following. Eminently the time to speak the truth, the whole truth, frankly and boldly, nor need we shrink from honestly facing conditions in our country today. This great nation will endure as it has endured, will revive and will prosper. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror paralyzes needed efforts to convert retreat into advance. In every dark hour of our national life, a leadership of frankness and vigor has met with that understanding and support of the people themselves, which is essential to victory. Convinced that you will again give that support to leadership in these critical days. Those were the words of Franklin Delano Roosevelt at the beginning of his inaugural speech on March 4, 1933. So this is a good time for us as the, the year draws to a close to take a good look at the predatory culture we are about to leave behind. It's not the culture of this year. It's not the culture of this decade. It's the culture of 50 years of nihilism from 1969 through now 2019. It's not the only thing that went on in those 50 years, but it is what drives those 50 years. Nihilism and decay in economics, politics, culture more generally. Exemplified, for example, by the ending under Nixon of the United States, a, a very, very successful Apollo program. Ironically, it's going to be the reassertion of man's extraterrestrial imperative through the relaunching of the Moon-Mars space program that's going to reverse, almost like it's overnight, the descent into the inferno that we've been seeing for the last 50 years. We, we, we have a situation in the United States where we are able to now bring a conscious end to that entire system. And the impeachment process may ironically be the very way that that gets uncorked, the ending of the entire half century of, uh, of collapse and decay. We can use the United States presidential system uniquely to accomplish this. And, and that's a bit of what I want to say something about before we get started. Now, people are familiar with the fact that there are three branches of government, executive, legislative, and judicial. But this is thought about very much like a, an administrative structure somehow that has a certain genius to it and allows for balance of power. That's not what is actually the way that the country runs. The three branches of government are arranged such that the citizens of the nation can take advantage not merely of the institutions of power, but the institutions of deliberation. Now, what are the institutions of deliberation? That's the United States Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. If the citizens know those two documents, particularly the preamble of the United States Constitution, the general welfare clause within the preamble, but the preamble as a whole, we, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and ensure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution of the United States of America. That preamble written by Governor Morris of New York, Alexander Hamilton's closest friend, that preamble and the Declaration of Independence are the institutions of deliberation of this population. And it's actually not it is possible to, for you to ignore much of what you hear in the Congress, much of what you even hear in the Supreme Court, if, if you as citizens, we as citizens, 
study these documents and study the presidential system that came into being, which was based on those documents. Now, Alexander Hamilton's presidential system, as that was practiced with George Washington in the first presidency, is the most efficient means for allowing the people who incorporate themselves for this purpose to make a revolution in their state of affairs without violence, without bloody revolution. That's the brilliance of the United States Constitution. But the presidential system had a very spe- uh, specific character in the first presidency, and that was expressed in particular by the four written reports that were prepared by Hamilton for Washington on credit, on the creation of a national bank, on the development of a manufacturing economy uh, to supersede the largely still slavery-dominated agriculture of the United States, not because the United States was pro-slavery, but because there was a faction in the United, uh, in, in the United States that was backward enough to maintain slavery. And then finally, the constitutionality of all of these, of these three arrangements for credit, for manufacturers, and for the National Bank. So those reports allowed for and promoted revolutionary changes, which even a corrupted Congress – uh, cannot allow, cannot stop if the, if the citizens use the presidential system in the way in which they are actually given the power. And that's what Franklin Roosevelt's presidency was largely about. Uh, I'm gonna, and then I have, I, I want to just reference again that uh, inaugural address where Roosevelt says, recognition of the falsity of material wealth as the standard of success goes hand in hand with the abandonment of the false belief that public office and high political position are to be valued only by the standards of pride of place and personal profit. There must be an end to a conduct in banking and in business, which too often is given to a sacred trust, the likeness of callous and selfish wrongdoing. Small wonder that confidence languishes, for it thrives only on honesty on honor, on the sacredness of obligations, on faithful protection, on unselfish performance. And without them, it cannot live. I, and he said then, restoration calls, however, not for changes in ethics alone. This nation asks for action and action now. Now, that is something that is to be supplied not merely by the presidency, but when the Congress fails – Or the courts may fail, and that's not exactly our situation right now. It's a very interesting situation we have with what's going on in terms of the courts and what we're seeing around the impeachment. But what can be done is that the citizens can take action. They don't require the permission of anybody to take that action. And we of the LaRouche Political Action Committee have talked about the formation of committees of correspondence for this purpose, what we call our emergency alert service, and so on. Now, just to give a little idea about why it is that the citizens themselves should think about establishing their own sources of news, take these two items that I found in my mother-in-law's old discarded New York Post of one week uh, earlier. Uh, There were actually several items in there, but I got two I'm going to reference. All right. The first one is this. A Fox business reporter was arrested last week after trying to sneak a crack pipe into the downtown Manhattan federal courthouse. Sources say he confessed after being discovered by a security officer who saw a strange bulge in his sock. Uh, The reporter bemoaned that he had recently just lost his job at CNN and was, quote, in big trouble. Now, I ask you, Should we be trusting someone like this to give us our news? How about the story about CBS's 60 Minutes, where this female associate producer at London CBS office has accused the 60 Minutes producer, uh, Michael Gavshon, who's run that show for 27 years from London. He's 63 years old. She accuses him of sexual harassment. See, he tells a story. See, what happened was he sent her an obscene picture of himself kissing on a campfire from 1973. But he pled not guilty, saying that he meant to send send a picture to his sister, but he was drunk at the time, and he mistakenly sent it to his 35-year-old colleague. Now, this guy is 63 years old. 
I don't know about you, but I don't think at the age of 63 I would be sending pictures of myself pissing on a campfire to my sister. Seems a little bit uh, risky and a little bit, uh, well, maybe kinky. Should we be? Should our, our news be coming from these kind of people? Let's leave finance out altogether. I mean, we get to Epstein with that. Then you have this weirdo Howard Rubin who ran the Soros Portfolio Fund, who just got accused of, of uh, you know, he's been accused by sexually molesting, molesting many women. Uh, but they had a letter that they produced from this guy in a case that got recently saw, uh, resolved, I guess, last week, in which he says, the evidence that you consented to our SNM encounter is overwhelming, and you have no chance of obtaining a judgment against me. I will testify publicly that you are a professional prostitute who agreed to have S&M sex me with $5,000. If you read Michael Lewis's book, Liar's Poker, or you read The Big Short, you'll see this guy Howard Rubin in there. He's one of the big-time Soros portfolio people. Should we trust the economy to someone like that? So while, you see, if you look at that and you look instead at the optimism that we encountered at the Turning Point Conference down in Florida, which I believe some of you heard us talk about, the optimism we've been getting from people, from Americans around the space program, the optimism that's otherwise in, in evidence by the fact that there's a fight going on around the presidency for a change, ask yourself this question. Who is more qualified in the United States to turn off this failing culture in which these people have nothing to say to us than the citizens of the United States? Now, we're going to be discussing several different areas of action and action now that can be taken. But in order to do it, we've also got to be telling you something about the way in which the blackmail operation is intended. One of the things we'll touch on tonight, among other things, is this issue of universal surveillance, among other things. But I want to just say, as we get into looking at this in terms of the close of the year, we're looking at the possibility of sweeping away a predatory culture, utilizing the very impeachment process that was intended to destroy the presidency. The irony of that is the exactly kind of delicious irony we need to be delivering for our people to consider all over the United States, so that their citizenship suddenly becomes the subject, not their surveillance, not their subjecthood, not their uh, uh, financial uh, slavery and indebtedness to a system that is itself morally unfit to survive. So we're going to begin with Barbara, and then we will hear from our good friend Bill Binney. So Barbara, are you there? I'm here. So look, okay. I want to highlight a, a couple of things and, and, and to basically talk a little bit about some vistas which have opened up for us just over the past week. First, I want to caution people that the period we're entering in the new year is a very, very dangerous one. Uh, the United States Senate is not a slam dunk in terms of the coup process and impeachment, despite how it's being portrayed uh, everywhere in the media and on your TV sets. Uh, basically, there's 53 Republicans and 49 Democrats and independents. And many, if not most, of the Republicans are not real allies of the president. They're wedded, if you watch them, to the globalist and imperial war policies and the ideas of Bush and Obama, which this president, to their underlying rage, continues to disrupt. While the two-thirds vote required by the Constitution for impeachment is not there presently, there is plenty of room to play havoc with the rules and procedures of a Senate trial using the anti-Trump Republicans as the battering rams. Now, moreover, not dismissing this entire House fraud right now as the fraud that it is continues to delegitimize the president at a point uh, which is very dangerous in the world. And tonight the president tweeted accurately, mm -hmm. the continuance of this impeachment process is destroying my ability to conduct the foreign policy of the United States. 
Now, forcing the president to bargain with these senators, allowing them to continue to demonstrate their Washington, D.C. independence from him through such permanent warfare atrocities as the recently passed National Defense Authorization Act, which continues to rage and, and, and make warlike noises towards Russia and China, creates the appearance to the world that this president is not in control of U.S. policy. And it's not an accident that the coup collapsed with Robert Mueller's disastrous appearance in the Congress only to reappear once again only one day later with this Ukraine-gate nonsense. The very process right now of allowing this thing to live in the U.S. Senate encourages the traitors in our midst to act because they believe they are protected by what most recognize as Washington's most corrupt legislative body. In short, allowing the coup to continue this way is a clear and present danger, and we should be telling everyone we're talking to that this impeachment nonsense must be ended now, and decisively so, so that we might concentrate on this nation's and the world's future. Now, I'm told from our street organizers that there's a really powerful revulsion going on out there in the population to this impeachment and the coup. People just can't stand this nonsense while they struggle to get health care, struggle against the epidemic of drugs and suicides, struggle to make ends meet with rising prices and lack of food production, and they recognize that the coup is limiting the president's ability to act on their behalf. So with the Durham and Barr investigations and the Horowitz report of the last week, there are some very extremely useful elements, weapons, if you will, which are appearing by which we can defeat this entire thing readily. (coughs) But we have to actually pay attention to what these things mean. Uh, Dennis talked tonight about getting rid of a decadent culture. And there's only one unique way that I see, a unique pathway to do that. And that is in this political movements, unique role of educating this population about actual physical economy and classical culture and the science of physical physical economy. Those are the twin pillars, twin, twin, twin pillars, if you will, upon which we can build out of this mess a completely new political movement based on LaRouche's ideas. And that movement, particularly the component of a new youth movement, is essential in 2020, right now, in the year which is approaching, a year which which because of our presidential election and the mass strikes against globalization which are now occurring throughout the world, presents itself, the year 2020, as really an actual turning point in human history. Now, Joe DiGenova, the former U.S. attorney for Washington, D.C., gave an interview on Monday morning in which he said that John Durham, the U.S. attorney examining the origins of the coup against the president, is spending lots of time with Mike Rogers, who used to be the head of the NSA. DeGeneres says that the broader story of Russiagate is that Barack Obama in 2012 undertook to create a complete surveillance regime explicitly targeting anyone who might upset the apple cart of Obama's administration policies and their continuance in the election of Hillary Clinton in 2016. And that Mike Rogers has the goods on this, according to Geneva, and is providing them to Durham. Obviously, Donald Trump was the major and most consequential target of this surveillance, but it went way beyond that. According to Geneva, Obama actually created a much bigger list, a much bigger enemies list, and a much more uh, ideological means for, for doing so than, than Richard Nixon ever thought of. 
Now, Larry Johnson had previously re- reported the same shocking fact about a program of political enemy surveillance beginning in 2012, reported it on this very show previously. Larry also reported to, on Monday and last week that a significant addition to this surveillance policy occurred in October of 2015 when John Brennan created a new cyber <coughs> war unit within the CIA, uh, what's called the Directorate of Digital Innovation. And as Larry has reported here and elsewhere, there's substantial reason to believe that the personas DC Leaks and Guccifer 2.0 were created by this unit within the CIA. And for those who know the story, DC Leaks and Guccifer 2.0 uh, were the first uh, personas to leak the so-called documents which were ultimately released by WikiLeaks. And what Larry says and others actually can show by the actual physical evidence is that Guccifer 2.0 and DC Leaks are absolutely false personas who created a fake cyber trail pointing to Russia in other words, a false flag deliberately created pointing to Russia as the author of an intervention in the U.S. elections. This was, quite frankly, uh, the U.S. version of a, of a cyber war process which was already in full bloom in Britain. There, uh, the cyber war focused on the Russian intervention, so-called, into the Brexit uh, election in 2016, in which Britain voted to exit itself from the European Union and struck a major blow against the globalist regime worldwide. As we've written, Christopher Steele, operating at the highest levels of British intelligence, preceded his war with Donald Trump by blaming Brexit on cyber manipulations by the Russians in papers he wrote in the early part of 2016. <clears throat> Steele's dossier, now completely debunked by Inspector General Horowitz's report, in reality, in any sane population, would have been debunked at the point when it was issued. If you read it, it's a bunch of obvious garbage. And Steele's, Steele's ability to sell it is precisely because our elites actually are operating within a fishbowl in which they believe their power over the population allows them to sell products which are incompetent, reckless, and easily debunked if rationality returns to a population. So... Why did Obama in 2012 initiate this latest and most crude iteration of the surveillance regimes, which date from 9-11? I don't know whether DeGeneva is correct about Mike Rogers and Durham, but I do know that what he, has, what he is talking about and what Larry is talking about in terms of a surveillance regime dated from 2012 and residing in a Barack Obama enemies list is a true fact. And you have to also take into account that mass surveillance remains a huge, compelling, and cultural problem here, although it is now also being recognized. <clears throat> the New York Times just ran a series over the last three days showing how once you accede to location apps on your smartphone, your every movement is being tracked by Silicon Valley. You have effectively volunteered yourself to be a surveillance subject, just like Carter Page became one through the fake FISA warrant. Dr. Robert Epstein has demonstrated to Congress and elsewhere that Silicon Valley, Google et al., literally control through artificial intelligence 2.6 million to 10.4 million votes the margin of the popular vote in 2016. Now that everyone knows and is conscious of which states determine the outcome, 
and Silicon Valley, as well as the British House of Lords, have declared that Trump must be defeated at all costs. What do you imagine they are doing now? Now, let's go back to 2012 and why Obama did this. When you look at the year 2012, what LaRouche described at that point is that that's the blossoming of what he called in articles at the time of a final march to war with Russia and China by the international elite. And that march to war began with the 2011 NATO bombing of Libya and the assassination of Gaddafi. At or around the same time in 2011, NATO countries began calling upon Syria's President Assad to step down amidst the Arab Spring, another London-based intelligence operation. And first they imposed sanctions on Assad, and then they began bombing, threatening all-out war with Syria in August of 2012. That war mobilization was based on a NATO false flag operation, which had Assad using chemical weapons against his own population. Again, a total fraud. The British Parliament's refusal of British participation in NATO's planned Syria war was accompanied by popular outreach, outrage here, and Obama backed off. But he continued to use actual terrorists, the predecessors of ISIS and the remnants of al-Qaeda, as the shock troops for regime change against Assad in a war with U.S. participation, which is only now ending. Then in 2014, NATO, a front for the British since World War II, in complicity with Obama's State Department, Brennan's CIA, the National Endowment for Democracy, George Soros, and the British Foreign Office, captured Ukraine, what Carl Gershman of the National Endowment of Democracy had been describing on the pages of the Washington Post openly as the ultimate prize in waging what he called Cold War 2.0 against the Russians. Like the terrorists deployed under the U.S. flag in Syria, in Ukraine that nation's long-standing Banderas Nazis were used as the shock troops for regime change. This set off a civil war which pioneered new uses of cyber and whole of nation, as they call it, propaganda warfare, to both control the captured Ukrainian population and to use this new base to conduct propaganda and cyber war and actual military operations right on the borders of Russia and against Russia directly. That Joe Biden, who performed the role of a modern-day British viceroy for Obama in Ukraine, managed to place his coke-addled son in a position to profit to the tune of millions is really only a secondary aspect of this story. Right now, the neo-Nazis we empowered are actively preventing Ukraine's new president from pursuing peace or an end to oligarchical corruption, the policies Ukraine, Ukrainians voted for overwhelmingly in the recent elections which form the backdrop to now Ukraine Gate. Similarly, the whole-of-nation black propaganda techniques first employed in Ukraine have been brought home in the coup against Donald Trump in the United States, in which repetitive, negative, and false media is the primary instrument. And there is a real question as to what role these Ukrainian Nazi cyber warriors played in the 2016 election. Now, three things interrupted and destabilized this march to war begun in 2012 by Barack Obama and the British. In 2016, Donald Trump won election in the United States, and Britain voted to exit the European Union, striking a massive blow against the globalist regime supported by Obama and his British masters. Prior to that, President Putin intervened strategically throughout the world, including in Syria, to halt the course toward world war. And China, in 2013, began a massive effort to develop infrastructure throughout the world in the Belt and Road Initiative, successfully crusaded against poverty in its, on its own part, raising millions out of poverty, 
and provided an island of strategic economic stability and a vital flank against the sanctions regimes used by the globalists to cripple target economies throughout the world. Now, LaRouche said that this march to war, commencing in 2012, was really the result of the financial collapse which manifested itself in 2007-2008, and the intellectual and cultural <clears throat> inability of a decadent elite class throughout the world to imagine doing anything differently than they had been doing prior to the collapse. True, they managed to stitch, stitch together and hold the line on a false narrative about the causes of the collapse. No one could have foreseen it. It was a historical accident. The bailout basically saved things and started a recovery. Populations had come to expect too much. And even then, back in 2010, 2012, when you go back and look at it, they were saying that a Green New Deal would produce thousands of needed jobs if people only had patience to transition from the old to the new economy. At the same time, of course, the nation was being looted and jobs were being destroyed by the very same people and the very same policies. Further, LaRouche pointed out that historically, this regime of endless wars and green economic austerity were really the result of policies first put in place by Henry Kissinger and Zygmunt Brzezinski in the late 1970s and early 1980s. He noted that the decadent elites promoting these policies believe ultimately and incompetently that nuclear war can be won and will be beneficial to their cause. And he cited the primary goal of these people as reducing the world's population by three quarters because they're looking for a population level which their insane economic policies can actually support. They need a smaller, a much, much smaller world, world population in order to survive with the policies which they envision continuing. LaRouche remarked that these people simply do not know how to create an economy which can re reproduce itself at higher and higher levels of economic development, and they oppose this idea because it would mean the realization of a truly human economy, one not run by corrupt elites or oligarchs. Now, in this new year, what LaRouche was saying then about the decadence, incompetence, uh, the murderous intent of these elites is becoming widely recognized. The population now, as we run into it in the field, is clearly recognizing that the emperor literally has no clothes, but still asserts confidently, as he or she stands there naked, the right to rob the population blind. This population has finally begun to mock and laugh at these people. We have a huge chance now to change all of this, as Dennis said, to reverse the entire decadent course of the last 50 years on this planet, a course which increasingly seems absolutely insane, as Dennis emphasized by why should we listen to these uh, sexually crazy news people, it seems absolutely insane and absurd to most. And given the actual physical state of the economy, surveying the skill and education set of the population, which is the driver of any economic renaissance, there is only one path to sustain survival. Not immediate survival, as LaRouche distinguished that, but sustained su survival long-term survival, survival of a prospering economy which lasts through generations, imagining the future and an economy which persists 50 years hence. And the path to that future lies in building right now the economy of the future, making the strategic leap into a fusion-powered economic development program and expanding the Moon-Mars mission, which this president has announced, 
while talking to Russia, China, India, and other full-set economies about reorganizing the world's financial system in bankruptcy and putting into place the means to finance long-term development projects while collaborating to fund joint projects at the very frontiers of science. It also lies in classical culture, this path we're talking about, in the music and drama which allows a culture to actively reflect on the present state of its mental outlook and the present state of its development or the flaws in that development, that kind of culture which is found in the music of Beethoven and the dramas of Shakespeare and Schiller. There is a reason why President Lincoln insisted on reciting Shakespeare to his cabinet during the pathos of our civil war. As you look at the flat world presented by Hollywood, and popular culture, you find a world which holds no nuance, no irony, no metaphor, and only slapstick humor and a whole lot of perverted sex. In that flat political world, stick figure Manichaean warriors rage in a war conducted solely in the present, and their roles shift as they become either black or white knights. That world really is nothing other than, than a video game with no palette of actual human emotions or thoughts. This flat world, presented as a vision of how to think by our elites, is a world which poets, those whom Schiller called the real legislators of the world, can destroy simply by accurately presenting reality, accurately presenting the ironies and ambiguities of their present situation. It is a world in which a president can prevail against any foes by outlining and setting into motion a compelling vision of the future, a mission orientation which touches and moves the imaginations of the population. It is no accident that when President Trump spoke at the recent youth conference, Turning Point USA, his remarks about the Space Force received absolutely the most enthusiastic and lasting applause, more than anything else, and the President himself noted that as an extremely significant fact. So okay. that's that's what I wanted to sort of use as, you know, my opening and what I think we can proceed to discuss. Okay, great. So Barbara we got Barbara, now we've got Bill, are you there? Yes I am. Can you hear me? Very good, very good, very good. Yeah, you're with us. Let's just reference something here for people I everybody who's on probably knows that there are some new people. And though, therefore, let me just say, 30 years at National Security Agency uh, led uh, the nations in self-defense in areas now called or today known as cyber warfare, so on, but more, or signals intelligence was called by what its actual name was. But there's something that has happened culturally, and in the course of the last several years in particular, Bill's been very clear about it. So I want to put this in the context of what Barbara has said already, uh, that universal surveillance, surveillance which went with that Obama was effectively doing, for example, about, about a lot of people. Yet today we're talking about Donald Trump because it reached that high up finally. But the, the world that we have changed using the threat that has now been placed on the presidency is a world that Bill is very familiar with. And, Bill, I'm not trying to simply uh, pigeonhole you into that as a response, but I just wanted to say that much because I think one of the things we can do for people is to just give them a kind of picture of what <coughs> not up against, but what it would mean if we actually cracked through on the Russiagate matter, what it would mean if we actually crack through on this issue of universal surveillance. So go right ahead, Bill. Take it in any direction you wish. 
Well, I, I wanted to maybe address some of the uh, reports that are coming out now talking about the uh, use of GPS and tracking people uh, throughout the world. And, in fact, I think uh, uh, there was one article in Zero Hedge and it came up in another uh, a place where they showed an array of, uh, of uh, dots in the Pentagon and dots inside the White House and, in the, and on the stock market and so on. Each one represented an individual. And each one is trackable individually, uh, and follow. They can follow any of them that they want to. Uh, and this is a part of the. This is taking basically taking the GPS off your cell phone, and it's like amassing it on everybody in the world. And it's called. And it's fed into a program called Treasure Map. And that the objective of that program is to um, basically know where every device is on the network every minute of every day. So in other words, uh, you know. They're tracking everybody in the planet, <laughs> and that's now and that's now being it's now coming out. But it, it's really been it was exposed originally by Edward Snowden in some of his material, but not too many people paid attention to that. The the Supreme Court has ruled about uh, tracking uh, without warrants, and you know this is tracking everybody without a warrant, and it's the same with tracking everybody through their emails, phone calls, and so on, and all the content involved in that too. So it's really massive amounts of data and that's all and that's why it's important for rogers to be talking uh, because rogers is he ran the stellar wind program for example as well as the other bulk acquisition around the world and he was the uh, he was the guy in charge of managing that program and that acquisition and collection uh, and that's why he's been involved in building the bluffdale facility you know <clears throat> the director of nsa is involved in that and and getting getting Congress to a lot more monies to build another 2.8 million square foot facility on Fort Meade because they're collecting more and more. Uh, you know, it's just, uh, and so uh, this is why I maintained from the very beginning uh, in August of 2016 that uh, this Russiagate story was a farce and a fake because NSA has all of that data. Now, there's another article talking about CrowdStrike not really being able to tell who did the hack, and that's right because they can't. Uh, what it simply means is that there, once hacks are used, uh, they're out there in the world. Once they're out in the world, you know everybody's got them. They've they've got access to them. So that simply means that uh, now, in order to really know who who in fact is doing the hack, you must use trace route programs to follow the, the uh, follow the hack around the world. Uh, and if you don't do that, you don't know who did it. Period. That's just the, that's just the truth. That now CrowdStrike does not have that capacity and capability to do that, but NSA does, and that's where all of these fiber optic taps and what have you, and storage of data and collection, and and trace routes through different hundreds and hundreds of trace routes programs around the world, they have embedded in the switches and servers. They originally it was to try, I think, to recover from the uh, TOR program, but now they've, I think, infiltrated TOR to the point where that doesn't make that much difference anyway. So uh, the, the point really is that uh, Rogers is the guy who has all of the data, and now that he's uh, being put on, I think he's being put on the spot because he's been, uh, he's been a part of this all along. Um, so, you know, it's not, uh, he's not really uh, totally... Uh, without uh, blame here, uh, simply because when you manage a program that's unconstitutional, you know it's unconstitutional and it is uh, 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 basically a crime against the and then viol a violation violating the Constitution and any number of laws of the United States government, like the Pen Register Law, the Electronic Privacy Act, Electronic Security Act. Uh, all of those, and that's why they had to give retroactive immunity to the telecoms, if you all remember that, back in 2008. That's why they had to do that. And it was done in, in secret. I mean, uh, some of the people in the intelligence on the judiciary committees were wondering why. Why were they being asked to give retroactive immunity to the telecommunications companies by the government? Well, the reason is pretty simple. They were uh, turning over all the data on their customers, U.S. citizens, and giving and supplying and managing wiretaps for collection of content and metadata on the upstream program, which is the fiber optic taps, where they use uh, Naris and Verint devices to take down everything on the line. 
It's not just metadata. They've been lying to you all from the very beginning, just like they lied to everybody about you had to give up privacy to get security. That's been a lie from the beginning, and they've known that. They just uh, there was more money in 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 uh, in using that lie to get the people to think that that's really what is necessary uh, to actually uh, you know to succeed and make everybody safe. Well, that was a lie, and and they knew it, uh, and so did. Uh, so did the uh, politicians involved, because they already knew that we had succeeded at solving that problem um, in, the, in the 1990s. So, uh, you know, the whole thing is we're all being fed a pack of lies, and we're expected to swallow it. And that's the, that the point is to get people to understand. That they've been able to keep everybody through the mainstream media lack of uh, addressing the issues. They've been able to keep everybody... Um, uninformed and uh, in the dark. This way they can manipulate everybody and make them do what they want to do and pull their strings in any direction they want and expect to be believed because there's no other story out there. And that's what the mainstream media is culpable for. So they're all, they're all a part of this. Uh, even the judges come, for example, in, in Roger Stone's case, uh, I had put in an affidavit uh, that, that simply said, uh, you know, the rush gates of fabrication, and I have forensic evidence to prove it. You know, the whole thing was a fake from the beginning, a fraud. Goose for two was a fraud. The, the DNC leaks were, were done inside. It was local, downloaded to a storage device, and, and physically transported. So, and I had the forensic evidence to, to show it. I mean, the group I'm working with, I'm, I'm kind of the out in front of it, but there's like six of us involved, plus a couple other associates in, in Europe, who are involved in looking at this, and it's it's really uh, pretty straightforward and clear technically. There's no issue at all. It's not a question of you know rationalizing anything or getting the sense of anything. There's no subjective adjustments uh, judgments here at all. It's all objective. So um, and but the judge would not let me testify to that, and the reason of course is because the entire case against Roger Stone was predicated on the Russia hack and his involvement with that, with then with WikiLeaks. Well, the evidence on the forensic evidence just disputed and clearly made all of that to be a fraud. And so their entire basis for the uh, for going after Roger Stones was uh, was uh, false, and they knew it because they were a part of helping to make it. And so, you know, um, so I, I I just say the judges are a part of this too, and you know they're not really they're not really interested in truth. It's still passing this fairy tale along as long as they can keep it covered up by by keeping the, the the truth out of the mainstream media and out of the out of the knowledge of the population of the country then then they'll succeed okay thanks a lot bill q and a session has started to ask your question please press star six comments and while they are doing that bill i wanted to ask you to do one thing uh, while people get you, you reference this business about retroactive immunity taken by the phone companies. What what period are we talking about in which this this process that you described went on? Uh, that was in 2008, mm-hmm. under Bush and Cheney. They pushed that before they got out of office. Mm-hmm. Okay. We're getting people in the queue at this point. Barbara, did you have anything you wanted to say or uh, about what yeah, Bill has I- said so far? Yeah, I mean, I, I I agree that basically. I mean, first of all, I think that you have to have to make the distinction between uh, what one hopes for and and what you have to make happen. Okay, and and that's really an important distinction that has to be made at this point. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff which is floating around where everybody who's been following this coup is extremely hopeful, and there's reasons for that. You know, there's no question, but that, you know, you, there there are breakthroughs being made at this point on a certain level of things. What our job constantly has to be, like I did tonight, is I'm pretty convinced, having looked at all of the evidence, that what is being said about by Larry, by others, about this uh, upswing in the surveillance, if you will, to political targeting of people specifically... Uh, you know, opposed to Hillary Clinton uh, and any candidate and anybody, uh, you know, 
who are who was not going to support Clinton and many many other people by the Obama administration commencing in 2012 is a real fact. It coheres with everything that we've actually looked at in terms of when did the NATO Strategic Communications Center come into being, where did this most most recent round of this type of targeting occur, and Bill you know, is quite correct in saying this goes all the way back to Snowden and has been going on for years, but there is a very specific kind of point at which we get the current round of of crap which has been thrown at us. And that seems to me it's real possible that we can make a huge breakthrough on at this point. So, you know, the way we have to think about this is not to get wound up in in the sense of saying, oh, well, that's a good development, that's a good development, that's a good development. It's to say this development means we're right on the edge where we could break through on it if we as citizens decide that we're going to not allow this, this myth to continue, period, end of story. And the way to do that, I think, is that, that you know, we have – you know, really a mass upsurge going on worldwide, and a mass upsurge appears to me from the readings I'm getting from the field organizers against the coup and against this impeachment in the United States. The danger is going to be complacency or sitting back and being the spectator. You have to look at the possibilities which are inherent in this type of stuff actually being widely identified at this point, and it has to be acted on, which I think is is what Bill is also getting at. And when you start to look at it that clearly, you see really the emperor doesn't have any clothes now. The president is being extremely truthful about the situation. He's saying, look, guys, if you keep this up, I can't conduct foreign policy. That should scare you, but it should scare you into action. And to saying, you know, hey, we're going to hold a pitchfork to my senator at this point and say, let's just stop this right now. We need, we have important things to do. This is a turning point possibly for humanity this year. Let's go about doing that. And the pathway that I outlined, i.e., for us in this movement, um, is very clear to me at this point. It's it's actually rests with our unique expertise in being able to show people a pathway for real economic development, which is rooted in Lynn's views of political economy and physical economic development. And it's also rooted in classical culture. It's rooted in people experiencing how to actually look at history and how to look at it in terms of a nuanced sense of causality. Uh, Bill does that when he actually creates his program for the NSA, which was called Thin Threat. And it used the highest ordering principles known to mankind in terms of mathematics and, and I would say, Carl Gauss, to come up with a, with a form of uh, surveillance which actually identifies the bad guys without creating a totalitarian state and saying that because we have bad guys and we have terrorists, we have to have a totalitarian state and mass surveillance to actually catch them, which is the myth which is absolutely untrue. So that's what I would have to say about that comment, and I think we should go on. Yeah, I know, Bill, you may have something to say, but we got a bunch of people in the queue. We're yeah, okay. going to ask you to hold right, your take comments yeah. and kind of take them as, as we go. Sure. Uh, again, press star six to get in the queue. If you have a question or comment, let me go to the first person. Okay, are you able to hear us? Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, now we can hear you. Good, good. It's really more of a comment. Uh, Barbara mentioned Robert Epstein. Hello? Yes, he's calling. Ted Holden, Victoria, Texas. Go ahead. Okay, Barbara mentioned uh, Robert Epstein in this uh, presentation he made regarding what is called SEAM, or Search Engine Manipulation Effect, to the U.S. Congress. And I've... um, in communication with, with uh, the office of Ted Cruz and Michael Cloud, have mentioned a number of things that need to get fixed in a sort of a hurry, but the two most critical, I think, are number one, this whole question of the use of SEAM techniques by, by Google and possibly Facebook. Okay, I don't know anybody who's ever sworn an oath of allegiance to Google and Facebook. I mean, the idea of having our government 
determined by those organizations a formula for civil war. Okay, that, that has to stop. I mean, you know, the, these tech giants have to be brought to heel. That's number one. Number two is that we need to have some kind of a bomb-proof voting system. Okay, and to me that means minimally. Minimally it means like blockchain technology and it means open source software. You know, we simply cannot have like any kind of a voting system or software for any kind of a voting system, which, is, which involves companies which are only controlled by George Soros or anybody like that. Okay, those two things I think are absolutely critical. Okay, let's get an answer. Bill, you want to take it, or? Well, I agree, but uh, I'm. Uh, I, if you, uh, of course, I, I, I'm not an advocate for blockchain. Um, I'm, I'm an advocate for multi-dimensional uh, encryption, <laughs> not single-dimensional. So, uh, so I, I, and it reduces the, the the problem with blockchain. But I do agree that the the, uh, <clears throat> the voting coming up is and ensuring that. Votes that are that are counted are are votes that are le- made by le- legally eligible uh, U.S. citizens. I believe that that's certainly uh, and a very important thing for us to to focus in and make happen. And I think that uh, some of us and I know there's some other people who are working on uh, ways and means of making that um, come true. And uh, hopefully uh, we'll we'll have some influence in, in and 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 I think paper ballots are ultimately uh, the ground truth that everybody should have as a backup for the for a uh, recounts, you know, because uh, manip- any time that the data is transferred through a system, electronic system, from one system to the other, like reporting to counties, from polling stations to counties to states to gov- to the federal government. That it goes through devices and across networks uh, that make it that expose it to uh, to um, manipulation. I mean, even even when it comes to um, see, the point is, uh, even if you encrypt it going across lines, when it re- is at rest inside uh, servers or computers, it's uh, it's accessible uh, and and in, in a and a, <laughs> that's a dangerous thing to have happen. Really, it's something you need to ensure uh, some way of making it possible that uh, nothing could be uh, – things have to be air-gapped, that they can't be accessed to, uh, in the network, that's all. Uh, and that's, that's one of the major, major issues. And uh, I agree with you. Voting is really an important thing to, for us to look at. Okay, very good. I think we're just going to go on because we have so many people. And, again, mm-hmm. Barbara, if you have something you want to add, be fine. No, okay. I, 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 people who haven't read it should actually read uh, Epstein's analysis, which is really available. If you just Google him, Robert Epstein, uh, you should read it. It's terrifying. Uh, and, you know, it's a reminder that, you know, when you actually think about this creature, which is described as the uh, so-called deep state by people, and which we describe as the British Empire, uh, most people who have looked at that inside the United States view Google and view Silicon Valley as a critical component of that. It is not an independent uh, group of companies out there somewhere. It's 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 part of the entire apparatus. Okay. Okay. Are you able to hear us? Hi. Good evening. Okay. You can hear me? Yes, yes. we can hear you. Who's calling? Uh, Daniel, New York. Um, okay. The president, starting with President Calvin Coolidge, main business of American people. Business is the business. Now, is the precisely what they give you the, the change? Precisely that they try to get an impression. This is the business between billionaires, Mister Mister Bloomberg, as we know, Mister Mussolini, and and a president, billionaire President Trump. So. Mr. Boomer, puppet of uh, Christopher Stillborn's Richard Dell. We try to, we, we, this is the game which they, they try to do that. They try to eliminate it. It's impression that people can be on site and waiting for something. So we decide what is the best for you. So I want to comment on that, please, specifically about that. Okay, let me make sure I understand what you said, and you guys may see if this is the same as what you understand. You're saying that there's the the game is is being posed to people as though there are two billionaires, one Bloomberg, as you called him, Mussolini, and you're saying versus the billionaire Trump. Is that what you're saying, or are you saying something different? Yes, exactly what you said. I'm saying that it's two billionaires. 
Uh huh. And you're okay. The game you're of asking them? about it. All right, right, and that people are sort of caught in the middle of that. Okay, so Barbara, you probably should take that, and we'll. <laughs> well, I'll start with Mr. Bloomberg. We've done some a lot of work on him in the past, uh, including, you know, whole sections of EIR which were devoted to him. Uh, the last time he, you know, seriously considered running for president, um, the guy is, as you call him, a fascist. Um, he is also, I'm, I'm reading a new biography of him now, which is supposed to be a pub piece by the New York Times. And essentially where it ends up is it portrays him, portrays him as a complete sexual pervert. And this is probably what's going to bring him down. He's apparently incapable of being around a woman in close proximity without making some form of lewd comment to her. And the result of that is that he has been isolated by his aides, uh, for the most part, from ever being around very many people in the population. That's why you basically see these millions of dollars in ads and very little public appearances by the guy. Um, you know, his his programs are, you know, the classic program right now for uh, rabid environmentalism. He is, you know, was the climate change guy uh, actually in charge of, of the British organizations for climate change. He maintains a residence in London, which is his favorite place to be. Uh, right. he, he's a knight of the British Empire. Um, and, you know, the, the thing which will ultimately destroy his candidacy is the obvious cultural problems which he has. We have some notions, uh, I mean, we, we have followed him very closely because he gave millions of dollars to a, uh, you know, a, a, a group of, of actual sexual perverts in New York City, uh, which had come around the Labor Committee way, way back at the beginning of of the 1970s, uh, called the Centers for Change of, of Fred Newman, and that later became uh, Leonora Fulani's uh, political party. It's a psychological therapy cult, which Bloomberg wholly supported, spent millions of dollars supporting so that they would give him a ballot line by which he won uh, <clears throat> the mayoralty of New York shortly after 9-11. Um, so I think he's got a lot of baggage, and I think his major commitment, obviously, is to the Green New Deal and to this entire British mm -hmm. uh, population control program, which I spoke about, which is really what it is. And it's the idea that the country is somehow going to be saved by a combination of identity politics and uh, population control through fascist environmental uh, policies and deindustrialization. And I just don't think that's going to sell to the American population, no matter how much money he spends on ads, but he is dangerous. So, therefore, we're going to have some fun and actually kind of go out and, and do stuff and destroy him before the population. So that's what I have to say about that. Okay. Very good. Thanks. Thanks. All right. We have a text. Can I add one thing you. here? Yeah, Let me add one thing to what uh, Barbara said uh, about uh, this pedophilia ring and so on. All of that is uh, in the databases inside NSA, and all of it is retrievable. If they really want to get them, they can do that. The problem is they don't have the will, I don't think, to do it. Okay, and there was a question for you, Bill, which is uh, asking for you to speak on Vault, the Vault 7 material and its relationship to the Russia hoax. Uh, should there be hearings on this? And if Congress refuses, uh, can we if so we so can we not figure out a way to instigate a citizens' investigative commission? So maybe you should say to PMX, uh, even though first of all, what Vault Seven refers to. Yeah, this whole uh, Vault, Vault of, Seven uh, was the uh, <clears throat> WikiLeaks publication of hundreds of millions of lines of uh, source code. Uh, that represented the attacks that uh, were, were known and used by the CIA. Uh, some of that, I'm sure, a good deal of it came from NSA and GCHQ, so I'm not sure. I'm quite sure it's an international problem. So, <clears throat> but uh, the point is that uh, it had tens of thousands of attacks on servers, switches, you know, firewalls, um, networks, um, all kinds of uh, attacks through operating systems and so on. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and and the and and 
they never fixed it. Now, my problem has always been that that's very short-sighted, finite thinking on the part of our people in government, the bureaucrats that make up the deep state, okay? Because what they were looking at is saying, I want to be able to read everybody's material, and so <clears throat> when I find weaknesses, I'm not going to tell anybody about them. I'm going to just use them to read what everybody's saying. That way, I have, I have power over everybody. And, and, uh, and then I, it gives me the opportunity to create another swindle. This is the, the, the second swindle I thought of, which was uh, cybersecurity, uh, which simply goes like this. When we get attacked, uh, they always ask for more money for cybersecurity. Uh, well, you know, the, the real point is that they're leaving us all out here fat, dumb, and happy thinking we are secure, and we're not because they've got tens of thousands of attacks they already know about, but they haven't fixed. So if, if my point is pretty simple. That's the finite thinking. If they fix the problems they have known about all along, and this goes back decades, by the way, uh, then we may have some cybersecurity. Then if they get attacked, sure, then we can say, yes, yeah, you, now you deserve to have money to deal with it. But until then, no. Okay. Uh, and uh, you mentioned, Bill, that this is also an international problem. I think the other part of the question was, uh, what about even trying in the U.K. to instigate a citizen's investigative commission? I think well, if, if we could do that, yeah, if we could do that, that would be a good thing to do. Anything to expose yes. this uh, charade that's going on. Okay. All right. Very good. I'm going to go back to the phones, and then we got another text question, which will come due. All right. Let me go to the next person. Are you able to hear us? Hi. Uh, my name is Marty from uh, New York City. And okay. um, the, the question I have is uh, just understanding uh, how to recognize and who to trust and uh, I, I see this process of going from where we are today to some time in the future, kind of like going through a, uh, a, a phase change, like a sound barrier or something where we really don't know what's on the, the other side, but we need, you know, coaches and whatever. But I, I think what uh, I'd like to hear from Bill and, uh, and the others um, you know, like what are the first three or four steps in the path of the direction that we really need to go? And I heard a few of them, uh, but my question really gets to the point of as we're in this uh, journey, uh, we, we've we got U.S. government officials or whatever you want to call them who are supposedly uh, on our side as patriots and uh, people who are optimistic but then we got people that, uh, you know, uh, hieristically, uh, you know, are foreign governments. And, you know, who do we trust? And do we trust foreign agents more than the uh, people who are supposedly our our saviors or our protectors? I mean, that that's the, the thing that gets me is that as we're on this journey to that other side, now how do we navigate this? Uh, you know, that's really a tough question, because uh, if you look at even President Trump, is having difficulty navigating that, uh, you know, because uh, quite frankly, I, I mean, we just don't know who you can trust. I mean, fundamentally, uh, you know, you would hope that you could trust your own intelligence community to do the right thing. But now look at what they've been doing with him, the IC, the NSA, the CIA, FBI. You know, the DOJ, the State Department, all of them. Look at what they've been doing to President Trump. I mean, I'm not counting, not counting the Democrats. This is, these are the bureauc bureauc bureaucrats in the, in the deep state. I mean, they've been, uh, a lot of them, I guess, are, are, in, are plants by Obama, but, you know, or, or others uh, who simply disagree with the president. Well, it's not their job <laughs> to make the decisions he does. Their job is to try to implement the policies he sets. So, I mean, for the government. So, I, you know, I, I, it's really going to be a hard thing for everybody, not just, uh, not just the individual citizens, but also for, for any leadership in government, too. I mean, it's, this is not a simple problem. So maybe as we go, I guess, uh calls like the, the one that we're on, maybe that's where we get the, the coaching to do whatever it is that we need to do. Uh, you know, so maybe there isn't an answer to what I just asked, but maybe 
it's uh, stay tuned and wait for the uh, the instructions. Yeah, well, it's the idea of getting the knowledge of what's really going on out to the to the people of the country. I mean, and that's that's what they've all been really working to keep keep hidden from everyone is knowledge of what's really happening and what people are doing. I mean, that's that's really I think uh, the most important thing we can do anyway. At least, at least that's the fun like the most important thing I I've, I've been trying to do. I think you do that, but I think you also have to have to really uh, approach the question a little bit differently than the way you're approaching it, which is there is, you know, a, a font of, of uh, you know, ways to a method of thinking by which you can actually test the truthfulness of what anybody is telling you, um, and it's called critical thinking, and, and, you know, a good place to start which we're talking about when we're talking about these committees on correspondence, is you go and look at, at Plato's dialogues, for example, um, and look at, look at how deliberation is done there uh, as, as, as you go back and forth with ideas and you chase, really chase the truth, uh, you know, start to practice forming hypotheses in terms of what you actually think is going on, and then test them. You have to be active in this process. It's, it's how you begin to master approaching things, which is very difficult in our culture because right now there's an evolving culture which is just beginning where we're throwing off the shackles of the way, uh, you know, you're, you're, you've been told to think about these things. Uh, you know, people are generally recognizing, at least in the reports that I get, is, you know, I don't have to put faith in these people anymore. They're not producing for me. Then the question which arises is, okay, what what does a productive society actually look like? It's something we haven't experienced here in the United States for, you know, about 50 years. And, you know, younger people get very excited about this and have a duration which some of us older people don't necessarily have but they can truly energize us if we form a youth movement to do precisely that, which is what we're calling for. And second, you know, as we actually look out there, it's not a question of waiting for instructions. It's a question of learning how to think for oneself in a way which actually leads to truth. And, you know, that's, that's a process which you just have to, have to basically undertake and experiment with and check in on and become active with us. That's, that's the whole idea here. Okay, thanks. Okay, very good. Go to the next person. Yeah, can you hear us? Yeah, hi, uh, Dennis, and hi, Bill and Barbara. Right. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes, we can. Yeah. yeah. This is Gerald Petschenuk out on the West Coast. I've been uh, continuing the mobilization that Helga LaRouche called for two Saturdays ago to break open the story about the Russia Gate hoax. And I'm happy to report that after a first series of articles appeared uh, on uh, different uh, websites and articles being reposted in uh, uh, things like Zero Hedge and the Duran and uh, others uh, like that, uh, there's now a second wave of articles appearing that have come across from interviews you did, Bill. Uh, one, for example, with Mike Robinson in, okay. uh, in England. That was reprinted today by 21st Century Wire. Then other websites picked it up from 21st Century Wire. Uh, then there was another uh, website, um, Popular Resistance, that picked up the story from uh, Eric Zussi, and then they uh, put, sent it out in the email to all of their subscribers. And then two more articles appeared today one is in the Gateway Pundit, uh, quoting you, and another called the Trends24.com. And, um, every, and, and I'm amazed at how, you know, starting with just a few articles, then being reprinted and reprinted, it, it, it's sort of having somewhat of a snowball-type effect. So uh, my question is to all three of you, 
is how do we, uh, this might be, shall we say, a small snowball, say a half-inch snowball. How, how do we turn it into a 10-ton snowball, you know, to really pulverize these bastards? And in, in particular, uh, the question I have beyond that is, in this Gateway Pundit story today, which does quote uh, you, it says that CrowdStrike actually has been lying all along, and you did mention this, or Barbara mentioned this, that their, their software cannot identify a hacker. So everyone's been told that the emperor has these beautiful clothes, that CrowdStrike can identify the hacker, but it turns out the whole big thing is a fraud. And it seems to me that's, that's a pretty big revelation there that should be spread out. So, so that's my question. How can we really keep expanding this? What are your suggestions? What are your ideas? And uh, are things like this, you know, things that could help blow the whole thing open? That's it. Oh, well, I, I certainly think that uh, what, what you're talking about is the exact way to do it. I mean, it's like, getting, uh, you know, it's like tweeting. If you have, if you tweet and uh, you have 20 people retweet and so on, uh, then those 20 are retweeted by another 20 and so on. It's an exponential thing that gets that, that then you can get to the entire population, assuming everybody did something a, uh, with the uniqueness. If each one had 50, 50 unique ones, I did the numbers on this, within four, four retweets, if, if they each one got to 50 unique people, uh, subsequently all the others did the same, then you could have the uh, you actually could reach more than the entire population of the United States in four retweets. That's 50 times 50 times 50 times 50. You know, so. Wow. So I think that's the way to go, and I think uh, you're you're talking about uh, what you're saying and what people are doing. I didn't wasn't aware of all of it because I'm I'm not really that uh, active in social media, but uh, so but uh, that certainly sounds like it's uh, gathering some really good uh, momentum. Yeah, I think we'll say a little bit more about this as we get to the conclusion. But I think the report's very good. I'm going to continue for a bit because we have. Uh, quite a few more people in the queue, so I want to make sure we get to all of them. All right. Are you able to hear us? Yes. Hello. Evening. Dennis, Bill, Barbara, yeah. yes. Omar Hello. Smith. Yep. Omar, New York, can you hear me? Yes, sure. Yes, you can. Uh, if we probably answered already, but this is a two-part question on the Ukraine issue. Um, one of the, well, I don't believe it's true, but the accusation going on now is that uh, Ukraine wasn't given military aid. Um, do you know of anywhere? Well, I'm probably not going to find it, but where is like the hard copy, hard evidence of proof that funding actually wasn't provided? Because uh, uh, if there's no actual hard evidence, then they literally just, you know, excuse the French, but pull it out of their ass. Second part is uh, how, if true, if. Um, Aid wasn't provided to Ukraine. How is that a domestic issue? If it is a, if it does end up being a domestic issue in the short term or the long term, your thoughts? Uh, well, I, I can go for it. I I think the the aid was delayed for 55 days, but eventually got there. So, um, but even so, I think uh, the president has a, a duty to make sure that whatever aid we provide to other countries doesn't go into the corrupt. Uh, structures of those countries and doesn't get wasted. I mean, then if the, if the, if the, if that's the case, why even give them the money in the first place? You know, so I think he's got an obligation to do that. That's why I found that very strange that the Democrats were taking that position about dealing with uh, foreign policy. Yeah, Bobby, you have anything? You want to get no, I, I just, I mean, I, I think it's it's useful to keep raising the, the, the actual reality of the issue, which is that, you know, it probably was a great thing for him to delay that aid and, and, and to consider not giving it at all. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's, you know, that's the thing which keeps getting lost in the sauce here. Uh, you know, that's right. Here, here's a bunch of neo-Nazis who 
did interfere on Hillary's behalf in the 2016 election and, you know, may very well have have been, you know, part of the, the cyber warfare against the United States since all of this fancy bear and other things. There's a whole lot of literature which says that that particular malware is actually owned by a uh, Ukrainian group controlled by the CIA. Um, I'm not sure that that's actually provable at that point, but certainly we are investigating that. Uh, so, you know, him giving aid under pressure from the Congress to do so, which is where it was coming from, you know, has been a central issue here in the whole Russiagate charade. And it's, again, a bunch of people in Congress being uh, nincompoops at best and insane warmongers and war criminals at worst who, you know, are continuing the Obama policy of containment of Russia and China and possible war uh, because they don't know how to do anything else. So that's what Trump was disrupting there, and that's really the actual issue of all of this stuff. Okay, very good. So we're going to go to the next question, then I've got a text question to go back to, and we've got uh, one more person in the queue. All right, are you able to hear us? Yeah, hi, Dennis. This is Rock in Oregon. Um, And Bill, thanks for a good briefing. Um, who was the Rogers you were mentioning? Because I don't think it's the uh, guy General was... Admiral Rogers, the uh, former director of uh, NSA. Okay, thanks. And then I wonder, yeah. can you maybe give us um, the current status of Edward Snowden's situation, and uh, maybe the same with uh, I'm sorry, Assange? Uh, and uh, how's Roger Stone doing? Is he like out on bail pending appeal, or what's going on? Uh, my, I, th- I think my understanding is with Roger, there, there, he's awaiting uh, sentencing. Okay. You know, uh, with uh, uh, Edward Snowden, I think he's still he still has to stay in in uh, in Moscow, in Russia, because he he uh, he would not be safe coming home. Huh. Um, so. Um, I think the and Assange. I think they're, what's what they're doing to Julian Assange is 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 just outright criminal. I don't know how anybody could uh, to- tolerate that. And not actually. I, I know the uh, European uh, courts have, have uh, basically said that what what they're doing to him is is uh, is, a, is a bordering on a war crime. So uh, you know, it's a it's really. Is you know, it's really bad active? what they're doing to him. I don't, I, I don't know. I, I, there's no other way to put it. You know, it's just they're, they're basically showing how criminal they can be. Yeah, I remember about two months ago there was a federal district court case. Uh, judge said that Assange's activities were purely journalistic, as I recall. Is there still an active effort to um, extradite him, or do you well, know? Oh yeah, I'm, I'm sure that what they, yes, w- yeah, what they go have ahead, to do Barbara. is, but yeah, go ahead, Barbara. I mean, I think it's one of the telling points of of, of how far, you know, uh, people are willing to go at this point. I just want to introduce one other, you know, flank in this whole thing, which is that you now have a bunch of people given the exposure of the fraud of, of the FISA warrant on Carter Page in the Congress who are actually talking about things like we should just get rid of the FISA court and maybe we should get rid of 12333 three, three, three even. Uh, which is the uh, executive order which is responsible for most uh, surveillance activities as opposed to FISA. And, you know, that to me seems to be the place where we really want to up the ante uh, and and say, listen, you know, uh, if Julian Assange is even capable of keeping his head together at this point, what should happen for him, which was on the table at the Department of Justice at one point in this episode, is that he should get immunity, and he should come and tell us what he knows about what actually happened here. And, you know, he should not be killed in a British prison, pure and simple. He is one of the, if if you're looking at this whole operation and you're thinking about it clearly, he is one of the few sources of evidence as to what actually went on here, which is in our national security interest to really find out. And so if anyone is essentially, uh, you know, going to be immunized uh, in this entire process, it should be Julian Assange, that he should have safe passage here and safe passage to wherever he wants to go after he gets here, 
uh, to actually tell the story of what he says happened. Does that come from Barr? It could come from Barr. It's a pressure point, most certainly, in terms of, of the morality of this entire situation. Which, you know, yeah. it's, a, it's a time to come clean at this point, and, and I think that from what we're picking up, provided we just keep pressing the truth about the situation in, in all its depths, I think it's really possible to have a breakthrough. Um, but the people out there are critical to this, because if you get a situation, for example, what I raised at the first of this call about the Senate, where people are complacent and they they start adding up the things and they say, oh, there's not two-thirds vote. Well, if you're complacent about that and you haven't got a pitchfork in the behind of your senator saying this has to stop now, uh, what does it mean when the president has to tweet, hey, guys, I got North Korea over here, I got a China negotiation over here, uh, the Russians have supersonic weapons, and we have to get into some form of negotiation about maybe some form of cooperative peace here in terms of a nuclear regime. And you guys are conducting this show in the Senate, and I can't conduct foreign policy. And Russia, what does that China, mean? and Rouhani just had military exercises. Joint military right. What does that mean? <laughs> and, 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 you know, it, it's absurd when you look at what's actually going on in the world and extremely dangerous when you look at what's actually going on in the world and there should be no complacency about this as you keep getting on fox where you know two-thirds vote they're never going to have it da, 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 da. you have to look at the world situation and what this president represents as a potential right now to change things drastically which is the entire reason for the coup and right. you have right. to basically put a pitchfork in the behind of your senator and say, let's just stop this thing right now. It's crazy. It's insane. And let's go about dismantling this entire, you know, surveillance regime, which Bill is talking about. It's, it's, it's not constitutional. We, we, we value the uh, free speech and privacy rights of individuals in our society. And since 9-11, we've had this crazy... And before, but since 9-11, we've had this crazy surveillance state, which is designed simply to freeze people in a rotten culture. We want to we want to change that. And I think people are really waking up to that at this particular point in time, which is the advantage we have. All right. Very good. Okay. Let me go on. Thanks. Okay. Can you hear us? Hi. Can you hear Hello? me? Hello. Uh, yeah. Hi. Can speak up a little bit? Okay. Sorry, I'm I'm on a uh, uh, earbuds. Um, so my question is for Who's calling? Uh, Dennis and Barbara: Is there a point where you think that there might be a similar situation to where Julian Assange gets Epstein, to where he just disappears for no apparent reason? Well, it's pretty clear from everything that's that's being said about his medical condition that his mind is already being consciously destroyed, and he needs immediate medical attention. And that's what people who are very close to the situation are pressing for very loudly, and that's also what we should press for very loudly. All right. Well, that's yeah. fair enough. I, uh, thank you. I just didn't know what, what the opinion was. Uh, if, if there's a situation where... You know, we don't have security camera footage or, you know. They're killing them out in the open. It's not like Epstein. They're just killing them right out in the open. So the point yeah, is right, exactly. you have to there's no, there, to stop that. Okay? There, there's, no, there's no reason for anybody to be confused about what's going on. It's a killing going, out, going on in broad light, daylight on Main Street. And what the whole purpose of what we've been doing, particularly around the, the idea of breaking the story around Russiagate, was <laughs> the whole purpose. The whole purpose I'm going to yield with that, and I'll leave you guys to the rest of the comments. Yeah, okay, great. Yeah, the whole the whole purpose of this, so everybody is clear that's listening, is that we have the capability of breaking this story. And we have a fissure. We don't have a crumbling of the wall. We don't have the fall of the House of Usher going on here. What we've got is a situation in which we've got a crack, and in that some people are now picking this up. But here's what we could actually get. If we organize in the right way for a united front around not merely the question of impeachment or surveillance, but shifting the culture, taking the panopticon, the virtual 
panopticon, that is the universal surveillance that people have bought into, have adapted, have become part of, if we decide that we're going to take this on as a cultural fight, then what happens is lives get saved in the short term. In other words, Snowden, neither Snowden nor Assange nor others can do what they need to be able to do unless the citizens of the United States, probably by means of this movement, join together in a very surgical set, a set of surgical a- a- operations. Mark Barber mentioned this idea around the FISA court. She mentioned also Executive Order 12333. That's actually the way that Lyndon LaRouche was targeted way back, um, uh, back in 30 years. Uh, and there are other these, – these things are – there are people discussing getting rid of these things. One of the ways to up the ante in the Congress is to exactly pose those questions so that what happens is that the people in the Congress are hit with things they don't, they don't even know about any longer. That gets reported back to the various operatives to think that they've got the situation under control. If there were any – serious initiative being taken that were out there by people associated with the LaRouche Political Action Committee that, that had the impact of radiating the way the bill was referring to before, these people would be given a different order problem. And, and that problem then creates a problem for them around the issue of the impeachment. So it's just something to actually just think about you know, from that standpoint. I'm not sure if you can still hear me or not on the call. Sure, go ahead. Um, I don't believe that Epstein is dead, and I don't believe that Assange is dead, but it could be a role reversal. Yeah, but you see, here's the so, thing. See, pe- people often say, well, not often, but sometimes people say things like that. Hey, there's something very simple. There's a test you can make of these things. And, and the, the, the problem involved is to understand the power of the citizen in real time. There's no reason for us to have to speculate on these things. All you have to do is force a situation where the idea that the Russia hack never occurred becomes, in fact, part of the discussion all over the world. If you do that, many other matters that seem inaccessible will become suddenly accessible. Now, now I'm not going to go through why that's true here because it goes beyond the scope of this call. Actually, the Saturday classes we've been giving, which are, are, are relevant to take a look at here, because this is a question of geometry. This is the question of the idea of Riemannian geometry, as it's called, as global strategy. There's a way to, in fact, access by means of a clarity, change the entire global configuration of everything. But you've got to focus all your uh, attention and all your power on a singular point of breakthrough. That's the way that you defeat any enemy. You don't worry about or speculate about whether something that you couldn't possibly know anyway sure, were true or not. You don't have to do that. The one thing that well, we don't have to speculate about is what happened in Russia sure. had. I, you have a very curious way of me not letting you interrupt you, which I don't want to do, but... Also, uh, Mr. Well, this wrote, is, wait, this is, this is, a lot he, of he wrote a book called The Science of Christian Economics back in 1991, and I believe that is more contemporary today than it ever was 30 years ago. So um, I'm not trying to speculate about geopolitics or, you know, who did this or who did what. Well, you speculated about whether Epstein is alive or dead, and I'm saying, in one sense, it's irrelevant. This is the whole point. It's irrelevant. Yeah. The thing that we can actually do is if we focus yes. on the Russiagate question and blow it apart, which is what you got the report earlier, Daryl, a few things, what happens is suddenly you've taken a big lie. With this, I'm going to yield there, and I will lie. leave it to the, the you, rest of the you, listeners. But you, wait a minute, hold on. You've taken a gigantic lie and demonstrated it to be such. Once you've done that, many other things suddenly become possible. And that's the, that's the essential point that this needs to be clear, which I don't think is often clear to people. Okay, so that's the issue. Okay, we're going to go to uh, the I, there's a text message I said I would. This is for you, Barbara. And this one asked this question. It, let me get to it here. 
Uh, yeah. Why do you trust Barr? He's widely known as a chief fixer for the earlier Bush machine. Uh, uh, didn't he play a role also in putting LaRouche in jail? And then also Durham, uh, you know, the, the, his earlier roles in protecting hedge funds, corrupt Wall Street operations and so on. The issue is why should these people be trusted in this, in this circumstance? They're not really, okay? I mean, first of all, I happen, I happen to presently have a hypothesis about Bill Barr, uh, and it's a hypothesis, okay? I've read his speeches. Uh, they represent a quality of mind which I didn't think necessarily existed in what I would call his earlier Neanderthal phase uh, when he was attorney general back in the Bush administration, um, he has since done a lot of work on the Constitution, and there was absolutely no reason for him to come in and take the role he's actually taken now. Do I think that he is, you know, playing a strategic game around, you know, looking at what's actually going on here and recognizing the enormity of what he's got to take on? I would say yes, and he's been very careful, and I've watched him very carefully, and I've tried to put myself, which is always what you can do in this thing, as opposed to saying, well, you know, he has all of this profile and that profile and what have you. What you do to actually analyze it in a good way is you put yourself in the other person's shoes, and you take a look at the overall problem in so far as you know it, and then you say, what you would do in this situation and watch what they do. And sometimes you will come to the conclusion that what they did was better than what you thought of. And other times you say to yourself, well, I didn't necessarily like that at present. And that's a question mark, which I put up there. But I don't come to a decision because we're not going to know ultimately what happens. And what happens is very much, I'm not out of the situation with Bill Barr. You know, I'm, I, as a citizen, am not out of the situation, and he's just going to do what he's going to do, and then I'm either going to condemn him or cheer him or what have you. What I do right now helps determine what Bill Barr does. If I can get a substantial outrage going with Lindsey Graham or in the, or in the uh, House still or with other people in the Congress like Mike Lee who, who, and, and Rand Paul who have been on this both on the surveillance stuff and other things, it creates a situation for Barr either to act or not to act. Uh, you know, how do you actually take apart the FBI at this point, which is in a war with you? If I'm trying to get evidence, which is clearly what he's trying to do, and you have to think through, well, okay, how is he going to get this FBI, which is very closed, not to destroy evidence in the course of his investigation? How is he going to play the game such that they trust him enough to that he can actually, uh, you know, get some informants working for him in this situation? It's a very complex problem, is what I'm saying. And you know, I don't put it uh, at the level of trust. I put it at the level of, okay, what's the truth, and how do I act in terms of the overall truth? And then I watch very carefully how Barr acts, but I, I take into account from an informed standpoint, what his situation actually is. Will there be criminal prosecutions in the D.C. court system at this point? Bill just told you what the D.C. court system is like at this point. Did, could, could you get a jury to convict these people in Washington, D.C.? It's a big question if you're looking at it from the standpoint of a prosecutor. So... You know, all of these things which people throw out about trusting people and so on and looking at existing profiles, there's a lot of time in life where profiles mean nothing. Uh, you know, I, I once had a judge called Charles Briant in the Southern District of New York who, you know, his profile was Roy Cohen, Eastside, uh, you know, Republican Club, um, you know, total bad judge to have on a case involving Lyndon LaRouche. He surprised me to death because he came out quoting, you know, uh, uh, you know, Hamilton and and quoting, you know, uh, 
uh, Madison and quoting all sorts of people in terms of, of establishing a president, precedent which actually stopped the government investigation, which is very difficult to do. Now, why did he do that? Well, that turns out that he was a lot more complex than what I thought he was or what I could find out from the media. So that's, that's really what, what the issue is with both Barr and Durham. And in my view, if there is such a public outcry that puts a great deal of faith in them that they disappoint, then, you know, it creates a situation in which it becomes very difficult for them to cover things up. But you have to take things into account in terms of how they act, which you may not even have considered. Um, you know, if I'm, if I'm the attorney general and I'm trying to break open some, some people to become my witnesses in the FBI or in the CIA, there may be all sorts of things I do which look a little crazy to someone who doesn't have the slightest idea of what I'm trying to do. Mm-hmm. So that's my answer to you. Okay, very good. We have two final questions in the queue. That's the last one we're going to take tonight, so we'll get to the first one. Okay, are you able to hear us? Hello. Hi, everybody. Yes, hello? Yes. Hello, hi. Mohammed Kamal. I'm calling from Queens. Merry Christmas to everybody. Thank you. I have Thank a, you. A simple question. Uh, is it possible to Pakistan join the NATO ally? Dennis, did you understand that? I was I not able to. Could you repeat the question? It's possible Pakistan join NATO ally. Is it possible that Pakistan will join what? NATO ally. NATO. Oh, NATO. NATO. Oh, okay. okay. NATO alliance. See, I really don't know. <laughs> <laughs> don't have the slightest idea. Okay, is that your question? That's the yeah, answer. That's my we question. don't know. Thank you. Okay. All right, very Thank good. You. Okay, can you hear us? Sure. Uh, Dennis, Barbara, Bill, uh, Roger from Baltimore. I think uh, <clears throat> Barbara has actually, I wanted to make a comment about trust, but I think uh, what Barbara has said in a couple of her uh, answers pretty well covers it. I think uh, trust, you can, uh, if you have personal relationships with a person that you're, yeah, you don't know quite how he's going, uh, the cultural level, and you can actually uh, have a good sense through his cultural acts, et cetera, not particularly the the technical stuff, but more the cultural of the way he is going, uh, either for you or against you. And uh, that's just what I wanted to bring up. And uh, Barbara covered quite well through, you know, her ideas about how Barr is in a particular situation, uh, what to, how to think about other people who hopefully are on your side, but you don't really know if they yeah. can uh, carry out what your hopes are. So uh, that's just what I wanted to comment on, you know, trusting uh, people allegedly on your side. Okay. Bye for now. Okay. Very good. Fine. So we're essentially at the end at this point. Um, and I just wanted to say one thing and then have you let you guys go ahead and summarize um, I think what happened in, in the course of particularly the last half hour of this call is important because we're trying to establish something about the characteristic of American citizenship. The American citizen, citizen is the most powerful uh, personage on the planet. Uh, he's not powerful merely because he's a citizen of the United States and supposedly the United States is the most powerful country in the world. It doesn't go that way. It, it's the nature of the power that's actually bequeathed to the individual under the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. And that because of America's power uh, over uh, particularly uh, the 20th century uh, and inclusive of today, if the American president acts and he acts with the authority of the Declaration of Independence and Constitution, then that's the most powerful force for good you have on the planet. 
uh, especially in conjunction with the presidents of Russia, China, and India in particular. Now, to activate that force, the citizenry acting as part of that presidential system, this issue is not whether, you know, whatever you're thinking of Trump or not, there's a presidential system that got established by Washington and Hamilton. And it gives, and when in the Roosevelt presidency particularly demonstrated it, because a lot of the changes that had to be introduced in the United States did not come from the, con- from the Congress of the United States. Sure, the Congress passed laws at a certain point, but it was the executive taking action on behalf of the general welfare that changed the country. Now, this president has stated very clearly what he intends to do with respect to the intelligence agencies and with respect to the military industrial complex and ending useless wars. That is useless to the people of the United States, maybe useful to certain people. And, 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 and so where we are as we approach this now conclusion of the year is, what can the individual, why is the individual citizen powerful? Because people, of course, tell us all the time they can't do this and they can't do that and we don't have the power for this. And maybe, you know, you know, maybe, maybe, uh, you know, Epstein's alive, maybe he's not. Maybe Hop is alive, maybe he's not. Maybe, you know, Elvis is alive, maybe he's not. I mean, the, the, the problem involved is the state of mind indicated by anything like that is, is, is you're outside of the process. But we're not. What's actually happened, as a matter of fact, from the time that we first put out the pamphlet on Robert Miller and uh, some of the things that Bill knows himself and earlier than that that he was doing with his thin thread team and so on, there, there's a way to actually break apart this apparent so-called monolith because actually these people are morally empty suits. They don't have it. They can't keep this system together because they're no longer morally equipped to maintain it. And so people are thinking, well, they have these sort of unlimited powers. Not true. That's what corruption does to you. It actually makes you stupid. And I think that what has happened is that we're in a situation very much like that. So I just want to urge that people uh, support the LaRouche Political Action Committee by giving money. They support the idea of these committees of correspondence by joining one or forming one and beginning a process of getting this material out to other people and that they uh, read and become part of our so-called emergency alert service that involves a daily briefing that we get out, uh, which you can receive. Just get in touch with the different people in your offices and they can help with that. So I, I just wanted to say that and then just give uh, each of you uh, just a, a chance to say some summary things about where you think we are, uh, you know, both in this discussion and maybe what what else you might have uh, just as thoughts for people. So, Bill, I think you should go first, and then Barbara will follow. Well, I I believe uh, some of the things we've uh, discussed here tonight are really uh, positive signs of moving forward, um, and I just think that that's important for us to keep that going. Uh, the other thing, of course, we've we've talked about uh, Barr and Durham. I believe uh, at least the sense I'm getting so far is that once they're uh, once they're starting to do things with uh, with Rogers and NSA, then they'll be able to break out all of this. Because one of the problems you see, the deep state uh, doesn't realize that when they do the bulk acquisition, they have they have compiled all of the evidence. That they of what the crimes that they are committing, and what they're doing, and who they're doing it with, they don't realize that that data is in there also. That's one of the reasons why, uh, when they killed uh, the program we had, they, they removed certain parts of it and they used the other parts to spy on everyone. But the one part they removed was the auditing one that was auditing who did what with the data, and how you know where they went, how long they stayed, what they looked at, and so on. That would expose all of the crimes that all the people in government are committing, and that's one of the things they don't realize that they have done, they have done by doing this bulk acquisition. They just felt it gave them power over everybody else, but what they don't realize is they've implanted the information that's a, uh, and it would enable anybody else to come back at them. And so, let's just see how far this one goes with Barr and Durham. Okay, very good. Barbara? Yeah, I think I think that the the other side of this is really that that 
that to move people beyond this kind of, of situation I described mm-hmm. where, you know, the, the culture which exists out there is kind of this, what I call a stick figure culture with, with, you know, you watch Fox News, you watch any of these things, and, you know, basically the the cultural stuff is the same. There's certain people in Fox News who are actually beginning to wake up and smell the coffee in terms of, of how the conservative movement in the United States has been shaped by precisely this kind of, of evil outside stuff. Tucker Carlson is one of them. Um but but the point is that that we have to make that much more widespread. And I was really encouraged by, uh, you know, how how much we were well received within these various uh, things we went to within the Trump movement over the last, you know, two or three weeks. It's very very clear that people out there are just hungry for an in depth view of a what went wrong. And B, how do we get out of this mess? And it's equally clear to me that presenting the space program as Trump has done and us expanding on that flank, as well as the flank we've had for a long time, which is the cultural flank, the the method of thinking and the deepening of the method of thinking and the ability to articulate profound ideas, as Shelley said, about man and nature, is really how are you going to change the environment overall here here in the country? Because the toleration of a Michael Bloomberg, who, you know, actually people accurately described in his mayoralty campaign as nothing but a walking hologram. In other words, the guy can't deal with people. He just does, spends his money on ads which portray him in a certain way. He's a hologram. He's an image, nothing else. The ability to ridicule that in a good way and show him up to people in a good way and to use satire and to use irony and to use all of the tools of the classical repertoire to portray the situation we're in and to portray the one we can go to, I think that that this year is really the time when we can turn things around, particularly when you have this open fight about the future of the United States and the 2020 election year coming up. So I'm optimistic, but it requires work. Okay, very good. So on behalf of the LaRouche Political Action Committee, I want to thank everybody for being with us tonight for the call. We're going to conclude at this point. There will be a call on Monday. You will get some uh, notice about that if you wish to join us for that. Uh, and we invite you to definitely get become part of the fight, help us break these stories, and help us create a condition in which the citizenry of the United States knows its own power and knows its own power by using it and deploying it. This session is no longer being recorded. Goodbye.